Namaste. Welcome to Quick Wisdom with Bliss. My name is Bliss. Meow. And this is my cute little furball friend, Joy. <laughs> Spirituality is everywhere. In the air we breathe, in nature all around us, and even written into our very DNA. We are energy, and together as energy, we're all connected. We're all one. United as one, we are here on the stage of life to love and help each other live the best we can. Now, I know you've come today to learn about a very special topic. So let's put on our fun caps and get started on this sacred exploration. This is Quick Wisdom with Bliss. Buddhism in 30 Minutes we live in a world filled rife with religions and beliefs, all of which are built on the principles of love, faith, and kindness. One of the most popular and kindness-filled belief system is Buddhism, and it's time to take a quick 30-minute journey through its ideals and more. Buddhism just happens to be the world's fourth largest religion. There are over 520 million followers worldwide. That means that 7% of the global population is practicing Buddhism. Buddhism is comprised of a variety of traditions, beliefs, and spiritual practices largely based upon original teachings of the Buddha and the resulting interpreted philosophies. Buddhism began in ancient India as a Sramana tradition sometime between the 6th and the 4th centuries BCE, making its way through much of Asia. Two major extant branches of Buddhism are generally recognized by scholars. Theravada, also known as Pali, the school of the elders, and Mahayana or Sanskrit, the great vehicle. Most Buddhist traditions share a common focus, overcoming suffering and the cycle of death and rebirth, either by achieving nirvana or through the path of Buddhahood. Buddhist schools vary in the way that they look at the path to liberation, the relative importance and acceptance assigned to the various Buddhist texts, and their specific practices and teachings. Wow! Isn't the world magical? It's always telling us something if we take the time to listen. Now, listen to this! Widely observed practices include taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Observance of moral precepts, monasticism, meditation, and the sowing of the virtues which are also known paramitas. Theravada Buddhism has a widespread following in places like Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia such as Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar. Mahayana, which includes the traditions of Pure Land, Zen, Nichiren Buddhism, Shingon, and Tian Shai, is found throughout East Asia. Vajrayana, a body of teachings credited to Indian adepts, may be seen as a separate branch or as an aspect of Mahayana Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism protects the Vajrayana teachings of 8th century India, is practiced in the countries of the Himalayan region, Mongolia, and Kalmykia. Buddhism is an Indian religion ascribed to the teachings of the Buddha, who was supposedly born Siddhartha Gautama and is also known as the Tathagata, or Dasgan, and Sakayamuni, the Sage of the Sakyas. Early texts have cited his personal name as Gautama or Gautama, Bali, without any mention of Siddhartha. The details of Buddha's life are outlined in many early Buddhist texts, but they are also very inconsistent and as a result, his social background and life details are difficult to prove because the exact dates are unknown. The evidence of the early texts advise that Buddha was born as Siddhartha Gautama in Lumbini and grew up in Kapilavastu, a town in the plains region of the modern Nepal-India border. It's believed that he spent his life in what is now modern Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. 
Hagiographic legends say that his father was a king named Sudo Hodana, his mother was Queen Maya, and that he was born in Lumbini Gardens. But scholars such as Richard Gombrich consider this a dubious claim because of a combination of evidence indicates he was born in the Shakyas community, one that later gave him the title Shakya Muni, and the Shakya community was ruled by a small oligarchy or republic-like council where seniority mattered more than ranks. Some of the tales about Buddha, his life, his teachings and claims about the community he grew up in may have been made up and inserted at a later time into the Buddhist texts. The Buddhist sutras say that Gautama was deeply touched by the innate suffering of humanity and its endless repetition due to rebirth. He set out on a mission to put an end to this repeated suffering. According to early Buddhist canonical texts and early biographies of Gautama, he first studied under Vedic teachers, namely Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta, learning ancient philosophies and meditation. The concept of nothingness and emptiness in particular. From the latter, and what is neither seen nor unseen from the former. He found that these teachings were not good enough for him to attain his goal, so he turned to the practice of asceticism. Unfortunately, this too fell short of helping him to achieve what he needed to, and then he turned to the practice of Jayana meditation. The Buddha famously sat in meditation under a ficus religiosa tree now called the Bodhi tree in the town of Bodh Gaya in the Gangetic Plains region of South Asia. It was there that he achieved insight into the workings of karma and his former lives, and attained enlightenment, certainty about the middle way as the right path of spiritual practice to end suffering from rebirths and samsara. As a fully enlightened Buddha, he attracted followers and founded a monastic order known as the Sangha. Once he had become Buddha, he spent the rest of his life teaching the Dharma he had discovered, until he finally passed on at the age of 80 in Kushinagar, India. Buddha's teachings were reproduced by his students and followers, which in the last centuries of the first millennium BCE became over 18 Buddhist sub-schools of thought, and each had its own basket of texts which contain different interpretations and authentic teaching of the Buddha. These over time evolved into the many traditions, which the more well-known and widespread in the modern era are Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana Buddhism. The four truths express the basic bearings of Buddhism. We want and cling to impermanent states and things, which is dukkha, incapable of satisfying and painful. This keeps us trapped in samsara, the endless cycle of repeated rebirth, dukkha and dying again. However, there's a way to liberate ourselves from this endless cycle and carry us to the state of nirvana. What do you think about that, Joy? Meow. <laughs> You're so cute, Joy. I love you. Meow. Sorry, lost in cuteness. <laughs> Let's continue. By following the Buddhist path to liberation, a person will begin to detach from needing and holding on to impermanent states and things. The term path is usually taken to mean the Noble Eightfold Path, but other versions of the path can also be found in the Nikayas. The Theravada tradition maintains that the insight into the Four Truths themselves can be incredibly liberating. The Noble Eightfold Path is well known in the West, but there's also a variety of practices and stages which have been used and described in the Buddhist traditions. Basic practices include ethics, meditation and wisdom, as told in the Noble Eightfold Path. An important extra and vital practice is a kind and compassionate attitude toward every living being and the world. Devotion is also vital in some Buddhist traditions and in the Tibetan traditions, visualizations of deities and mandalas are important. The value of study is regarded differently throughout the various Buddhist traditions. Textual study is central to Theravada and remains highly important to Tibetan Buddhism, while the Zen tradition 
takes an ambiguous stance. Samsara means wandering or world with the implication of cyclic, circuitous change. It refers to the idea of rebirth and cyclicality of all life, matter, existence, a fundamental assumption of Buddhism that you can find present in all major Indian religions. Samsara in Buddhism is thought to be unsatisfactory and painful and perpetuated by desire and ignorance and the karma that results from it. The premise of rebirths and realms in which these rebirths can occur is extensively developed in Buddhism, in particular Tibetan Buddhism with its wheel of existence which is known as the Bhavakra doctrine. Liberation from Nirvana, this cycle of existence, has always been the foundation and the most important historical justification of Buddhism. Later Buddhist texts tell us that rebirth can happen in six realms of existence, namely three good realms, heavenly, demigod, and human, and three evil realms, animal, hungry ghosts, and hellish. Samsara ends if a person achieves nirvana, the blowing out of the desires and the achievement of true insight into impermanence and non-self reality. Rebirth points to a process that beings go through a succession of lifetimes as one of many possible forms of sentient life, each running from to death. In Buddhist teachings, this rebirth does not involve a soul because of its doctrine of anatta, which denounces the concepts of a permanent self or an unchanging eternal soul, as it is called in Hinduism and Christianity. Buddhist traditions have usually disagreed on what it is in a person that is reborn, as well as how fast the rebirth occurs after every death. Some Buddhist traditions teach us that no self-doctrine means that there is no prolonged self, but there is an inexpressible self which migrates from one life to another. The vast majority of Buddhist traditions assert that a person's consciousness also known as the Vijnana, through evolving, exists as a continuum and is the mechanistic basis of what undergoes rebirth, re-becoming, and re-death. A person's rebirth is dependent on the merit or demerit that they have gained by their karma, as well as that accumulated on one's behalf by a family member. In East Asian and Tibetan Buddhism, rebirth does not happen right away and there is an intermediate state that branches between one life and the next. The orthodox Theravada position rejects this state and believes that the rebirth of a being is instantaneous. There are passages in the Samayutta Nikaya of the Pali Canon which look to offer support to the theory that the Buddha taught about an intermediate stage between one life and the next. In Buddhism, karma drives samsara which is the endless cycle of suffering and rebirth for each being. Good, skillful deeds and bad, unskillful deeds produce seeds in the unconscious receptacle that mature later, either in this life or in an upcoming rebirth. The existence of karma is one of the core beliefs in Buddhism. As with all major Indian religions, it implies neither fatalism nor that everything happens to a person is caused by karma. A central aspect of Buddhist theory of karma is that intent matters and is essential to bring about a consequence. Good or bad karma builds even if there's no physical action taken. Just having ill or good thoughts can create karmic seeds. Thus, actions of body, speech, or mind all lead to karmic seeds. A noteworthy aspect of the karma theory in Buddhism is merit transfer. A person gains merit not only through their intentions and ethical living, but they can also gain merit from others by exchanging goods and services, such as through acts of charity. Furthermore, a person can transfer one's own good karma to living family members and ancestors. In early Buddhist texts, it is the state of restraint and self-control that leads to nirvana known as the act of blowing out and ending the cycles of suffering associated with rebirths and re-deaths. Many later Buddhist texts describe nirvana, emptiness, 
nothingness. The Nirvana state has been described in Buddhist texts, partly in a manner similar to other Indian religions, as the state of complete liberation, enlightenment, highest happiness, bliss, fearlessness, freedom, permanence, non-dependent origination, unfathomable, and indescribable. It has also been described in part differently as a state of spiritual release marked by emptiness and realization of non-self. A vital guiding principle of Buddhist practice is the middle way, also known as Madhyama Pratipad. The middle way was a part of Buddha's first sermon. It was there that he presented the Noble Eightfold Path that was a middle way between the extremes of ascetism and hedonistic sense pleasures. This Eightfold Path is the fourth of the Noble Truths, and it asserts the path to the cessation of suffering, pain, unsatisfactoriness. This path teaches that the way of the enlightened one stopped their craving, clinging and karmic accumulations and thus ended their endless cycles of rebirth and suffering. Devotion is an integral part of the practice for most Buddhists. Devotional practices include prostration, ritual prayer, pilgrimage, offerings, and chanting. In Pure Land Buddhism, devotion to the Buddha Amitabha is actually the main practice. In Nichiren Buddhism, devotion to the Lotus Sutra is the main practice. Bhakti, which is also known as Bhati in Pali, has always been a common practice in Theravada Buddhism, where offerings and group prayers are made to deities and particularly images of Buddha. According to scholars including Indologist, Orientalist, Religious Studies scholar, and philosopher Karel Werner, devotional worship has been an important practice in Theravada Buddhism, and deep devotion is part of Buddhist tradition starting from its earliest days. Joy, are you ready to learn more? <laughs> That's what I thought. Here we go. Blessings of knowledge. Let these facts heal us with understanding. Guru devotion is a central practice of Tibetan Buddhism. The Guru is considered to be essential to the Buddhist devotee. The Guru is the enlightened teacher and ritual master in Vajrayana spiritual pursuits. For someone seeking Buddhahood, the Guru is the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, wrote the 12th century Buddhist scholar Sadhanamala. The venetration of and obedience to teachers is also important in Theravada and Zen Buddhism. That is quick wisdom if you ask me. What do you think, Joy? <coughs> <laughs> well said, Joy. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, are you ready to get deeper into this? Okay then. Buddhism, like all Indian religions, was initially an oral tradition in ancient times. The Buddha's words found in early doctrines and concepts, and the interpretations were transmitted from one generation to the next by word of mouth in monasteries and not through written texts. The earliest texts were transmitted in Middle Indo-Aryan languages called Prakrits, such as Bali, through the use, communal recitation, and other mnemonic techniques. The first Buddhist canonical texts were likely written down in Sri Lanka, about 400 years after the death of Buddha. The texts were part of the Tripitakas, and many versions have appeared thereafter claiming to be the words of the Buddha. Unlike what the Bible is to Christianity and the Quran is to Islam, but like all major ancient Indian religions, there is no consensus among the different Buddhist traditions as to what constitutes the scriptures or a common canon in Buddhism. The general belief among Buddhists is that the canonical corpus is vast. This corpus includes the ancient sutras organized into nikayas or agamas, itself the part of three basket of texts called the Tripitakas. Each Buddhist tradition has its own collection of texts. Much of these texts are translations of ancient Pali and Sanskrit, Buddhist texts of India. For example, the Chinese Buddhist canon includes 2,180 texts in 55 volumes, while the Tibetan canon comprises 1,108 texts, and all of these are claimed to have been spoken by the Buddha. 
another 3,461 texts composed by Indian scholars revered the Tibetan tradition. The Buddhist textual history is vast, over 40,000 manuscripts, mostly Buddhist, some non-Buddhist, were discovered in 1900 in the Dunhuang Chinese cave alone. The early Buddhist texts refers to the literature which is considered by modern scholars to be the earliest Buddhist material. The first four Pali Nikayas and the corresponding Chinese Agamas are generally considered to be among the earliest material. Apart from these, there are also fragmentary collections of materials in other languages like Sanskrit, Khotanese, Tibetan, and Gandhari. The modern study of early Buddhism often relies on comparative scholarship using these various early Buddhist sources to identify parallel texts and common doctrinal content. One feature of these early texts are literary structures, which reflect oral transmission, such as widespread repetition. During the Gupta Empire, a new class of Buddhist sacred literature began to develop, which are now known as the Tantras. Around the time of the 8th century, the Tantric tradition was very influential in India and beyond. Besides drawing on a Mahayana Buddhist framework, these texts also borrowed deities and material from other Indian religious traditions, such as the Shaiva and Pancharatra traditions, local god-goddess cults, and local spirit worship. Several features of these texts include the widespread use of mantras, meditation on the subtle body, worship of fierce deities, and antinomian and transgressive practices such as ingesting alcohol and performing sexual rituals. Historically, the roots of Buddhism lie in the religious thought of Iron Age India around the middle of the first millennium BCE. This period of great intellectual ferment and socio-cultural change was known as the Second Urbanization and it was marked by the composition of the Upanishads and the historical emergence of the Sramanic traditions. New ideas developed both in the Vedic tradition in the form of the Upanishads and outside of the Vedic tradition through the Sramana movements. The term Sramana refers to several Indian religious movements parallel to but separate from the historical Vedic religion, including Buddhism, Jainism, and others such as Ajivika. These fun facts fill my heart with happiness. I love learning, don't you? I hope these spiritual concepts are becoming clear. Let's keep learning! Several Sramana movements are believed to have existed in India pre-Buddha and pre-Mahavira before the 6th century BCE. These movements influenced both the Astika and the Nastika traditions of Indian philosophy. According to scholars, the Sramana tradition evolved in India over two phases, namely Pachika Buddha and Savaka phases, the former being the tradition of individual ascetic and the latter of disciples, and that Buddhism and Jainism had ultimately emerged from these. Brahmanical and non-Brahmanical ascetic groups employed several similar ideas, but the Sramana tradition also drew upon already established Brahmanical concepts and philosophical roots to formulate their own doctrines. Brahmanical motifs can be found in the oldest Buddhist texts. They are used to introduce and explain Buddhist ideas. Prior to Buddhist developments, the Brahmanical tradition internalized and variously reinterpreted the three Vedic sacrificial fires as concepts such as truth, right, tranquility, or restraint. Buddhist texts also refer to the three Vedic sacrificial fires, reinterpreting and explaining them as ethical conduct. The Sramana religions challenged and broke with the Brahmanic tradition on core assumptions such as Atman, meaning the soul or oneself, Brahman, meaning the nature of afterlife, and they rejected the authority of the Vedas and Upanishads, Buddhism was one among several Indian religions that did so. The history of Indian Buddhism can be divided into five periods. Early Buddhism, which is occasionally called pre-sectarian Buddhism, Nikaya Buddhism, or sectarian Buddhism, 
the period of the early Buddhist schools, early Mahayana Buddhism, later Mahayana Buddhism, and Vajrayana Buddhism. The early Buddhist texts include the four principal Nikayas and their parallel Agamas together with the main body of monastic rules, which survive in the various versions of the Patimokha. These texts have been revised over time, and it's not clear what constitutes the early layer of the Buddhist teachings. One method to obtain information on the oldest core of Buddhism is to compare the oldest extant versions of the Theravidin, Bali Canon, and other texts. The reliability of the early sources and the possibility to draw out a core of oldest teachings is a matter of contention. The three marks of existence, Dukkha, Anika, Anatta, may reflect Upanishadic or other influences. K. R. Norman supposes that these terms were already in use at the Buddha's time and were very familiar to his listeners. The description of the Buddhist path may initially have been as simple as the term the middle way. Over time, this short description has been elaborated upon, resulting in the description of the Eightfold Path. Similarly, Nibbana is the most common term for the desired goal of this practice, yet many other terms can be found throughout the Nikayas, which are not specified. Wow, I can feel my spirit evolving as we learn all this new and important information. And there's more! According to the scriptures, soon after the Pari Nirvana of Gautama Buddha, the first Buddhist council met. As with any ancient Indian tradition, the teachings were passed down orally. The primary purpose of this assembly was to recite the teachings to ensure that no errors occurred in the oral transmission. Indologist and scholar of Sanskrit, Bali, and Buddhist studies, Richard Gombrich states, that the monastic assembly recitations of the Buddha's teaching likely began during Buddha's lifetime, similar to the first council that helped compose Buddhist scriptures. The second Buddhist council resulted in the first division of the Sangha, probably caused by a group of reformists called Staviras, who split from the conservative majority Mahasamagikas after their unsuccessful modification of the Vinaya, a small group of elderly members, Staviras, broke away from the majority Mahasangika during the Second Buddhist Council, giving rise to the Stavira Nikaya. The Staviras created several schools, one of which was the Theravida school. Originally, these divisions were the result of disputes over monastic disciplinary codes of various fraternities. But around the year 100 CE, if not earlier, divisions and splits were being caused by doctrinal disagreements too. Buddhist monks of different fraternities became distinct schools and stopped doing official Sangha business together, but they continued to study one another's doctrines. As a result of all these schisms, each Sangha started to accumulate their own version of Tripitaka, also known as the Bali Canons, triple basket of texts. In the Tripitaka, each school included the suttas of the Buddha, a disciplinary code known as the Vinaya basket, and added an Abhidharma basket, which were texts on detailed scholastic classification, summary, and interpretation of the suttas. The doctrine details on the Abhidharmas of various Buddhist schools differ greatly, and these were composed starting about the 3rd century BCE and throughout the first millennium CE. Eighteen early Buddhist schools are known, each with its own Tripitaka, but only one collection from Sri Lanka has survived, in a nearly complete state, into the modern era. Buddhism has stood the test of time and with good reason. Despite the differences in the various teachings and techniques of the Buddha, there's one message that has remained crystal clear. And that, at the end of the day, this world is about one thing, and one thing that makes us all better people. Love. That's the greatest gift to this world. Now that's quick wisdom with bless, and that wraps up our learning for today's fascinating subject. I hope your spirit has grown as much as mine has. 
please come see me anytime to discuss more spiritual ideas and heart-fulfilling concepts. What was that, Joy? You don't want them to leave? Aw, neither do I. <laughs> well, they can stay if they want to. Now, let's meditate on our next adventure. Oh. Oh.